So good morning. Uh, my name is Vicki Fraser. I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all this morning to the inaugural um, symposium on um, advancement of women in the Department of Medicine. So I would like to first and foremost give a tremendous shout out to Dr. Rocky Diani, who this year was also promoted to professor of medicine. So congratulations to Rocky um, on her very well-deserved promotion. But I, I'd like to personally thank her for the tremendous work she's done over the past decade plus on advancing uh, women's careers, uh, leadership, and networking and support for women residents, fellows, and junior uh, faculty. So uh, Dr. Bayani has been the inaugural leader for the Forum for Women in Medicine. And you know this was sort of a dream um, many years ago, and Rocky really had a tremendous vision for how to bring people together, how to advance scholarship, networking, build um, programs, specific uh, educational leadership development programs um, for women of all stages of their careers. And, and she's just been an incredible champion uh, locally, regionally, and nationally. And we are so fortunate uh, to have her as the leader of uh, the Forum for Women in Medicine. I'd also uh, like to uh, acknowledge the leadership that's been brought uh, to bear to advancement of women in the Department of Medicine. Uh, by Dr. Sharon Kreshi and Dr. Hilary Babcock, who established the um, Ad AWEM, Advancing Women in Academic Medicine Program. And they're going to talk to you later about uh, that in the panel today, because they also recognized as, as subspecialists in the Department of Medicine who've been here for a while, what some of the challenges can be for women in various stages of their career. And, and really made an exciting new initiative through AWAM and, and through really standardizing and, and structuring the, the programs that we use for evaluating annual evaluations, but also ad advancing the career development of everyone. And then last but not least, I'd like to thank Dr. Abby Spencer, who is our new vice chair of education, who although predominantly focused on education and recruited to lead our educational efforts for our fellowships and residency and medical student education. She also is an incredible champion for uh, women's career development and gender equity and has been very actively engaged. So um, it's a real pleasure um, to, to kick this off this morning. I, I think um, today's program was really established to address some of the key elements about advancing women's careers, what we can do structurally to promote gender equity, to really address the complexity of intersectionality um, for, for people who are um, of diverse backgrounds and also women and the challenges that people face um, based on that intersectionality. And then also um, thinking about um, compensation and, and uh, gender equity as it relates to compensation and advancement. So we have some really terrific speakers this morning and I, I hope that everybody will uh, learn a lot from the programs this morning. So again, thank you all for putting this on. Um, and now back to Dr. Rocky Biani, professor of medicine and head of the Forum for Women in Medicine. Thank you for that really wonderful introduction. Um, so I wanna welcome everybody here today. I'm really excited about today. And as sort of Dr. Frazier had alluded to, we couldn't have done any of this without the help of a lot of people. So the first person I wanna thank is Dr. Frazier for all of her support, for all of our initiatives. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Abby Spencer, who's the Vice Chair of Education, who's uh, been a really great um, sort of sponsor and mentor for me, um, Dr. Angela Brown, who's the Vice Chair for Health Equity, and Drs. Hillary Babcock and Sharon Kreshi, who are the head of AWAM, as Dr. Fraser mentioned, and we'll hear from them in just a, in, in a little bit later. Um, and then just um, as Dr. Fraser mentioned, we have great speakers lined up for today. So I'm going to just start off the morning by sharing a little bit about um, about uh, the, uh, the initiative, the Forum for Women in Medicine um, that we started back in 2014. 
So, um, you know, we, many of you have probably seen this graphic from the AAMC. Um, and as you can see, there's, we've reached near parity for um, women in medical school. And then as you progress higher up in academic ranks and leadership positions, there's a steep drop off, right? So we're trying to figure out, you know, there's only about 18% of department chairs and deans that are women and only about 25% um, women that are full professors. So we have to sort of ask ourselves, like, what's going on? What's, um, you know, why are we losing all this talent? What are some of the factors that are at play here? And we know that there's been a lot of data, right? A lot of data that's been um, collected that highlights the gender inequities that exist in a lot of different arenas. So in pay, publications, promotions, mentorship award and awards. So a lot of these inequities exist. I think we can all agree that, that they're there. So we probably don't need to collect even more data to sort of make that claim. Now we have to figure out what are we going to do? What are the actual steps we're going to take to really help make changes to support the women in medicine, right? So we want to be able to support them so they can, so we can bridge that gap and, um, you know, lead so they can lead successful careers. So we, so while we're advocating for all of those structural and um, organizational changes to take place so we can make changes in policies and procedures and culture and climate and all of that, we need to find ways to support women now. Um, and so one of the things that uh, we created, like I mentioned earlier, back in 2014 was the Forum for Women in Medicine. And it was initially created as a way to sort of um, have some professional development for the women trainees within the Department of Medicine. Our programming goals were really to create um, leadership development skills, career planning and guidance, you know, opportunities for mentor support and sponsorship and networking opportunities. So when we think about, you know, sort of what the foundational benefits of FWIM are, one of the sort of key aspects that I find uh, has been really um, beneficial and impactful is really the community building part of it. So because our Department of Medicine is very large, um, it's, it was a great way to sort of uh, provide an opportunity for women to, to meet that wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to get together within our department. So it was a great way to get a community feel. Um, so, so sort of having social events, um, how we have a fellows outreach committee that um, really helps engage fellows that may otherwise feel a little bit siloed within their divisions. Um, we have a Dom Moms and Caregivers subcommittee that was started just a couple of years ago. And that was a really, that came out of um, a few um, women that came to me and said they really wanted to have some sort of, um, you know, community building for women that had caregiving responsibilities. So I think of this as sort of like the foundation for FWIM. Sort of the next aspect that I think about is sort of the networking aspect. So um, it, even though we don't have a formal mentorship program, it really, all of our events create an, or, an opportunity for sort of organic meetings um, with mentors. And over the years, several residents have said, you know, I, this is a place where I've met my uh, mentor and have had, you know, resulted in research um, projects and things like that. So again, it's just an opportunity. Uh, we also have visiting professor lunches. So when we have a professor that's here on campus, uh, they the you know everyone gets to hear about their wonderful research or their scholarly activities and their successes, and then we try to plan like a small lunch with them um, so that way women can meet them and uh, hear about their career journeys and sort of their career path. So again, another way to sort of network outside of our institution. Um, a, more, a more recent sort of addition is this Journeys in Medicine, um, Narratives with Women Faculty that was actually started by one of our uh, residents, um, Dr. Uh, Preet Sheikh. And what she wanted to do is to, to engage uh, residents across the, uh, across the various departments on the medical campus 
to interview um, women leaders within their departments and uh, sort of hear about their journeys. And so we have about, I think, 10 to 12 um, uh, interviews completed and they're on our website. And this year we've engaged our medical students uh, to sort of help out with this project as well. So it's a great way to sort of engage uh, medical students and give them an opportunity to sort of uh, talk to women leaders across the campus. After sort of thinking about the community building and sort of opportunities for networking, I think the the really key, one of the key aspects is sort of the skill building, right? We want to be able to um, impart all of those important skills um, to help women lead successful careers and really develop our next generation of women leaders. So our events um, started out really as um, inviting only a few faculty to serve as facil facilitators. And then we soon realized that this was actually a gap for all levels of programming. And so now for you know, the past, I think seven years or so, we invite actually all of our fac women faculty, all of our fellows and all of our house staff to all of our events, um, because a lot of the, the topics are applicable sort of at all levels. And it's, a, again, another way to sort of have this latter sort of mentorship of, you know, if you have faculty there, you have junior faculty, you have fellows, residents, and sometimes we invite uh, the medical students as well. So it's a great way to sort of have that um, and our survey data really reflects that the trainees and the faculties really find that the events are useful um, and, uh, and it's relevant to their sort of to where they are in their stage of their career. So, you know, providing community and networking and skill building is one thing and uh, but I think another aspect is really highlighting all of the uh, women within our department. So the faculty and the trainees. So to that end, we have a Facebook page and a Twitter page as well. Um, our Twitter page is more active uh, than our Facebook is just because I think Facebook is sort of uh, not as uh, widely used in, in the sort of younger generations. <laughs> um, so uh, we talk about sort of amplifying not just our events. So we post our events that are happening. We sh I share sort of articles that are relevant, um, you know, to, to women in medicine. Um, and then one of my favorite parts is really talking about and sharing uh, faculty and trainee accomplishments. So I have a PowerPoint sort of template. I send it out to faculty fellows and house staff, and they can uh, fill, fill in what the, you know, any sort of information they want to share. And it, it's sort of twofold, right? It demonstrates that we value them and we really want to celebrate who we have in our programs. But then we also are highlighting them outside of our department as well and outside of our organization and hopefully just sort of, you know, maybe giving an opportunity for some outside collaborations um, through sort of amplifying the work on a larger platform. We also sort of uh, leverage the resources that are available through collaborations on our uh, campus through uh, working with the Academic Women's Network, um, again, working with the students on our campus, and then uh, working closely with, uh, with AWAM as well as we sort of align efforts to, to have a greater impact on uh, the women in the Department of Medicine. Um, we sort of we also support scholarly uh, endeavors of our women faculty and trainees. And over the years, we've had uh, we've submitted workshops and posters, and even published a manuscript on work related to gender equity um, uh, at different regional and national conferences as well. Um, and most recently, we had two medical students working on a poster with us, and they were able to present at. Uh, the AAMC's Center for Group on Educational Affairs, and they were chosen for an oral abstract present presentation. So that they were super excited, and I was really excited for them as well. Um, so as we think about sort of our next steps, um, engaging allies is a really important one because we can't do this work alone. Um, and to that effort, we have started to be uh, to start thinking strategically about inviting our male allies to some of our events. And we've sort of dipped our toe in that and sort of really that's gonna be one of our next sort of steps that we're gonna take on. Um, and then 
as Dr. Frazier had mentioned earlier, just thinking about intersectional identities and working closely with other organizations um, and aligning efforts with um, OutMed and um, MEDA, which is a new um, initiative that's being uh, started uh, that's gonna be focusing on mentor mentoring uh, for underrepresented in medicine individuals within our department. So sort of engaging our allies is I think a really important next step. Um, longitudinal programming, we're, uh, we're, undergo we're currently developing um, some programming for like a FWIM trainee leadership development program to really take a small cohort through um, intentional sort of uh, training um, and workshops uh, over the course of, you know, six to nine months. Um, so that's hopefully will be uh, offered sometime this fall. Um, and then expanding our audience. So we have, you know, collaborated with other departments in the past, and hopefully we'll continue to be able to do that. Um, you know, thinking about offering things across the uh, GME, um, you know, wide across the campus. We have an upcoming event on family planning and fertility issues, and it's virtual. So actually, I, I reached out to um, the DIO, and they sent it out to the entire GME um, listserv. So again, where I can, I'm, I'm trying to see if we can engage, um, you know, people across uh, the, the campus as well. And, you know, again, engaging our fellows and our house staff and our faculty within our department to sort of continue with that community building and skill building um, and provide those opportunities for that. Um, so, you know, as I sort of end, I wanted to share the QR code for our website. Um, so there's more information on there. We have our committee members, our upcoming events, our past events, our mission and, and, and goals and things like that. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and as you know, my ask for all of you is just really to think about ways in which you can support um, women uh, within your own sphere of influence or so within your own little work environment. Because as we sort of start to make changes um, within our own um, area, we can sort of hopefully have a big impact on the on the greater sort of within your division, within our department, and and with on the medical campus. So. Thank you for allowing me to share this information with you. And I'm going to stop sharing now. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Spencer, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Bayani. And I just want to echo the thanks both to Dr. Bayani for putting this day together, as well as to our chair, Dr. Frazier, who really provides such support and advocacy and sponsorship and role modeling to really let this work that so many of us are passionate about um, happened. So thank you to Dr. Frazier. So it is now my absolute uh, honor and pleasure to introduce the fabulous Dr. Sue Hingle. Uh, Dr. Hingle is an internal medicine specialist and a professor of medicine. She serves as associate dean for human and organizational potential, which is probably the neatest title I've ever heard, um, and is also the director of faculty development at Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. She earned her bachelor's degree from Miami University and a medical degree from Rush University Medical College. She completed an internal medicine residency at Georgetown and completed the executive leadership in academic medicine, the ELAM program, where she continues to be a star inspiring uh, any of us lucky enough to be there with her. Dr. Hingle was recently awarded the very prestigious AMWA Elizabeth Blackwell Career Award. Additionally, she has received several other Awards including the Golden Apple Award, the Excellence in Teaching Outstanding Teacher Award, the Leonard Toe Humanism and Medicine Award, Most Influential Faculty Award, the Chair's Resilience Award. Uh, and Dr. Hingle was also honored with ACP's McDonald Award for Young Physicians and several ACP John Tucker Evergreen Awards for Chapter Innovation. Uh, she's been extremely nas um, active nationally in numerous organizations, including the ACP and AIM and AMWA and the AMA. She's a chair of the ACP Board of Regents uh, as a past chair and chair, past chair of Board of Governors. She serves on the AMWA Board of Directors and the AMA Women's Physician Section Governing Council. She was a senior author on the ACP policy paper on gender equity in physician compensation and career advancement. And Dr. Hingle strongly believes that we must focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as physician well being and fulfillment if we're going to be able to reach our full potential as individuals, organizations, and a profession. Um, and in her spare time when she's not doing all of those things, uh, she's just a remarkable 
mentor, sponsor, role model, advocate for women and in her Jedi sense reaches out to anyone and everyone who may need her in that moment. So it's a real treat to have Dr. Hingle with us and I can't wait to hear what she has to say. Thank you, Sue, for being here. Thank you so much. That was uh, an over the top introduction, but I appreciate it. So thank you so much. I wanna thank you, Dr. Spencer, Dr. Bayani and Dr. Frazier for this wonderful opportunity and more importantly for the, the really important work that you all are doing. So I'm gonna share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes. All righty. So I'm gonna talk about uh, some critical actions that we need to engage in to achieve gender equity. Um, I changed the, the front slide here for a couple of reasons. One, I used to have one of the uh, Chicago Cubs winning the 2016 World Series because their, uh, their um, mantra that year was everybody in. I figured I probably shouldn't use a Cubs uh, picture in, when presenting to folks in St. Louis. Um, and then I found this picture and I love it even more. So this is a picture of um, every year our medical students get to recognize five faculty at their graduation who have had significant impact on them for things from teaching to displaying humanism in medicine, um, lots of different things. And so they get to recognize five faculty. And for the first time in SIU's history, Four years ago, all five of them happened to be women. Um, and you can see in this picture, a very diverse group of women. There's diversity in age, there's diversity in ethnicity and race. Um, you wouldn't be able to tell from the picture if you didn't know them, there's diversity in specialty. Um, so just a phenomenal group of women. Um, you can see the joy on their faces. Um, you can see the joy in the people behind them on their faces as well. Um, and I think this picture really encapsulates to me a, a desired future state vision and also our progress towards that, uh, that desired state. So I have no relevant disclosures. The reason that we're talking about this is because we know that not only individuals, but organizations thrive when they have an engaged workforce. However, there's lots of issues related to, to getting to that, that desired state. Women positions are paid less, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, less frequently to rise to leadership positions, less likely to be promoted to full professor, more likely to experience burnout. When physicians are burned out, they're less likely to be actively engaged, more likely to leave an organization, and thus really figuring out how to promote cultures of workplace wellness are essential to, to this work. So we'll try to look at some of the links between equity, wellness, and organizational potential, the impact of bias and discrimination on women in medicine, and then some try to turn this into something active, things that we actually can do about it. And I wanna start out by stating that gender equity is not a women's issue. It really is a human issue and it affects us all. This is not a zero sum game. Um, this is really an opportunity for us to all, all engage in this important work. And when, when we advance equity for one group, really all, all groups benefit from this. You may have seen this picture going around. Um, I've seen it in lots of different forms and I loved this one because it really shows the difference between equality and equity and then also really what that desired future state is. So equality is making sure that everyone is given the same opportunities so they can apply for the same jobs, they can go up for promotion. You know, you can, um, really figure out what else it is that you want to work on. And equality is making sure everyone has that opportunity. It's important to take a step back and recognize that the reality of the situation is that that may not be enough to, to get us to that desired future state. 
we really need to change the lens to one of equity. And that is what do we need to do to help everyone be able to take advantage of those equal opportunities? And then the desired state is to remove those barriers altogether. So one of the things when I heard Dr. Bayani talking about what you all are doing at uh, WashU, um, you're doing a lot of phenomenal work. I would encourage you, and she briefly touched on starting to, to engage men in the work that you're doing. And this is really, really critical. Um, he for she is a solidarity, solidarity campaign that was started by the United Nations recognizing the fact that men still control a great deal of the power and thus have a lot of potential to, to really impact the changes that, that, uh, that we as a, a world actually need. Um, and so engaging all genders in this is really critical. And as I mentioned, it's not a zero sum game. We know that equitable environments have so many more benefits than environments in which there is there are issues with discrimination, harassment, things along those lines. We know that equitable environments have greater job satisfaction. When you have greater job satisfaction, you have higher productivity, you have greater worker engagement, you have less turnover, we also know that in equitable environments, there's enhanced communication, which obviously impacts the, the quality of the work that we do. There's greater levels of creativity. So if we're struggling with things in our work environment related to, to workflows or to assessment of our learners, we know that equitable environments really enhance that creativity as well as policy development. So it really is a zero sum game. If one group wins, all groups win. So it's not that we're taking something away from someone and that's important as we try to advance this work when you have people who are um, scared by it to really share with them. When I first started getting involved in some of this gender equity work, I was um, told by people you don't want to do that. You don't want to get involved with that type of work. You don't want to be known as one of those women. Um, but I learned that when you have a platform and you have connections, it really is imperative that you do get involved with this. So some of the reasons we need to get involved are related to, to both individual and organizational wellness. Um, related to individual well-being, we know that uh, physicians really struggle with this, and this has been exacerbated during the pandemic. We know that physicians have a much higher incidence of uh, substance use disorders. We know that physicians have a greater incidence of depression. And when that is not uh, um, attended to when that is not validated, when systematic changes are not put in place to improve that, we also know that physicians are more likely to commit suicide and women physicians have 130% higher incidence of suicide than the general female population. This is a graphic from the National Academy of Medicine's uh, Clinician Wellbeing Initiative. And I think the quote at the bottom really encapsulates um, the why. Healthcare professional burnout represents real suffering among people dedicated to preventing and relieving the suffering of others. So to me, there is just this really critical moral reason that we need to take care of this. If, if you don't buy into that moral reason, there are more practical business reasons the prevalence of burnout amongst healthcare professionals is cause for concern because it affects the quality, safety, and healthcare system performance. So one of the, the things that has been touted is the quadruple aim. Um, the triple aim has been around for a while. And as the triple aim evolved, it was recognized that a, a lot of the burden of trying to reach that triple aim 
really ended up on the backs of clinicians and was just really, really challenging. And so people added in improving the clinician experience as the quadruple aim. I would encourage us to take a step back and not have it be part of a quadruple aim, but actually have it as the aim. Because I think making well being the priority is how we get to the triple aim. There is a lot of evidence already, and there is additional emerging evidence that shows that uh, having engaged healthy clinicians have improved patient satisfaction, are more efficient and productive. And there's a great deal of emerging evidence that uh, patient outcomes are better as well. So the driver dimensions of well-being are numerous, and this comes from a Shanafelt article from 2017 about the driver dimensions of well-being. And you can see them on this slide, workload and job demands, control and flexibility, work-life integration, social support and community at work. Many of those are much more challenging for women in medicine compared to our male colleagues. Organizational values and culture, efficiency and resources. We know that women physicians actually get fewer resources than men do um, and also get less uh, staff support, which impacts the efficiency of the work that we do. So all of those driver dimensions make it challenging for us to be as successful as our male counterparts. And also because we are paying attention to all of those things, we are more commonly uh, losing the, the meaning in the work, which is at the center of it all. Dr. Templeton and colleagues wrote um, a perspective piece for the National Academy of Medicine focusing on gender differences and burnout. And they did a meta-analysis looking at numerous articles related to gender differences and burnout. Um, and as you can see on this slide, it really is ubiquitous across, across all specialties, including our specialty of internal medicine, but also internal medicine subspecialties, pediatrics, um, neurology, really it's across specialties. So something that is important to know at, because it also will hopefully help us to figure out uh, how we need to move forward. Some of the contributing factors to those gender differences are related to work-life fit. Um, I've started calling it uh, work-life kaleidoscope, um, but this is really challenging for women in medicine as I'm sure many of you on the call uh, have experienced. Um, we have a very um, gender-based society and women, though it is changing, still have a huge um, second shift load related to childcare. I know Dr. Bayani was running off to something related to her children. Um, so she's trying to, to fit in being in charge of this conference as well as uh, um, being with her kids for important events. And again, it is changing, but it still is um, in our society uh, a lot of that ends up on, what? on women. Um, autonomy and workload. Um, this is often where the leadership differences come in. We are, if we're not at the table, we don't make those decisions. Um, and that's, that's critical, for, critical for us to think about. And then gender discrimination and gender-based harassment. And we'll get into that a little bit. So I had the opportunity about, I think it started probably about six years ago um, and it got published uh, four years ago to be involved in the American College of Physicians uh, policy paper related to gender equity and compensation. Um, this all started with a resolution from the ACP's Council of Resident and Fellow Members asking the ACP to to take on the challenge of the gender pay gap. And as we started to dive into that, we recognized that it's way more complicated and the pieces are so 
so inextricably linked that we couldn't only uh, focus on the gender, gender pay gap without really looking at compensation and career advancement broadly. And that's what the rest of um, what we're going to talk about today is related to. So a couple of cases to represent some of the issues that, that we face. So Dr. G, and some of these uh, will likely resonate with many of you. She prides herself on being a highly sought after internal medicine specialist because of the comprehensive patient-centered care she provides to her patients. Many patients seek care from her because she takes care of not only their medical problems, but also their preventative medicine issues, as well as their psychosocial issues. Her quality metrics and patient satisfaction ratings are the highest in her practice. During her annual performance review, she's told that she's going to need to increase her productivity or take a pay cut because her RVUs are lower than those of her colleagues. And she believes, probably rightly so, that this is because she spends additional time with her patients on each of their visits. So the first position that the ACP took is that physician compensation should be equitable. And you can see what physician compensation entails. So it's pay, it's also benefits, it's clinical and administrative support, we know that women physicians, women in academics tend to get less clinical and administrative support. And even if on the books, um, it seems similar, the type of support because of those gendered expectations and gender biases, that support is less than that of our male colleagues. Clinical schedules, institutional responsibilities, Women physicians and academics often um, aren't on the decision-making committees. They are on the, the committees that really are very mission-focused. So the education committees, the committees that uh, help to provide support to our learners, to our trainees, but things that are not recognized um, as greatly when we go up for promotion. Women in academics tend to get less lab space and less support for their research. And there's lots of evidence that shows across the board, all of these elements in physician compensation are inequitable based on gender. So we know that there is a pay gap. Um, there's so much evidence about this. It still amazes me that people will push back and say that there actually is not a gender-based pay gap, but there is. And this was a study published in JAMA Internal Medicine that shows across the specialties, um, there is a gender pay gap. The only specialty that there's not a significant pay gap in is radiology. And um, radiologists, for the most part, get paid for shifts. They don't get paid per number of um, films that they read. So you can see that um, the the higher paid specialties, that gap is even larger. So orthopedic surgery, other surgical subspecialties uh, within our discipline of internal medicine, um, gastroenterology, um, cardiology, those have bigger pay gaps. So it really is across the board. The Annals of Internal Medicine published this article that looked at it within internal medicine. And when they corrected for all sorts of things, including um, full-time versus part-time status, age, level of experience, um, whether or not your spouse was employed, which is crazy, but uh, um, I'm sure you all have heard stories that show when there is an um, employed spouse, the pay gap uh, tends to be higher. Um, if you're a working parent. So they really looked at all of these and across the board, there is a gender-based pay gap in internal medicine. Women physicians make $200,000 per year on average and men 250,000 per year on average. And while 50,000, when you're talking about 200,000, 250,000 may not sound like a lot of money. If you think of a 30 to 40 year career, we're talking one and a half to $2 million 
dollars of lost income. So these are issues that are not unique to medicine. These, these are issues that really are across the, the American society. Um, the Institute for Women's Policy Research um, and the World Economic Forum have different calculators for figuring out when we will reach um, gender pay equity. And they factor in things such as um, levels of educational attainment, um, access to resources, uh, parental leave policies, um, things along those lines. So very policy focused. Um, and they are able to predict when they think gender parity and pay will happen. And in, let's see, where is Missouri on here? In Missouri, it's predicted that uh, gender pay parity will be reached in the year 2066. So still quite a ways away. The World Economic Forum um, looks at it by nation and it predicts that the United States will reach uh, gender equality and pay in the year 2186. So we have a long way to go unless we really get busy making some changes. The second case is Dr. W, who's a third year resident in internal medicine. She's exploring her career options after residency and she really wants to go to her hometown, which is from an underserved area. She is an African-American woman and she knows that there is a dearth of role models. And so she's really excited to return home. She's discussing her contract with a colleague who is also interested in working for the same clinic. And that colleague has identical experience and an identical position description. And her contract offer is 30% less than that of her male colleagues. So one of the second positions that the ACP took is really that there needs to be transparency and routine assessment of equity of physician compensation. Um, this is something that's critical and often cited when um, people say that there isn't a pay gap. People say that there isn't a way, you're not comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges. Um, the, the problem remains that uh, there is, it's hard to get this information. People are very protective of this information. Um, I think because they know that there are issues with it. Um, and so developing systems within your organization that allow for this transparency and this routine assessment are really critical. Um, I share a story of, um, I had shown up for our promotion and tenure committee, Department of Medicine's PNT committee meeting. And uh, to sit on the PNT committee, you have to be a full professor or you have to be a division chief. Um, and at the time, there were only two, two women on the PNT committee. And one day the other woman couldn't be there for some reason. And I walked into the room. Um, and I, I'm still not sure why I did this, but I said, am I allowed to be here? And there was some uncomfortable laughter and they said, yeah, why? And I said, well, this looks like a male only um, meeting. And we got through the, the discomfort, had our meeting, didn't think anything of it. A couple of weeks later, my department chair said to me, I want to thank you for making that comment the other day at the PNT committee, because it made me wonder why is Sue the only woman here? And so he started to dig into the data and he saw, not surprising to me, but surprising to him at the time, that women physicians in our department um, got promoted at a much slower pace than, than men did and often reached that, that glass ceiling of associate professor and didn't make it to full professor. That got him to thinking about pay and he started to look for discrepancies related to pay and found them, and then was able to develop an equity um, improvement plan for that. So it starts with transparency and routine assessment. The second thing that comes into play here is related to um, 
universal access to family medical leave policies. And the ACP really is wanting organizations to really work on getting a minimum of six weeks of paid parental leave. So it's interesting if you look at this across the world, one of the things that is often cited as why, why we don't as a nation have paid parental leave policies is the, the cost of it. So if you look at other industrialized nations, you can see that we are the only one that doesn't give any paid parental leave. Um, you can see the number of weeks that uh, um, Estonia, the Slovakian Republic, Finland, um, Hungary, over 150 weeks. So they actually get three years worth of paid parental leave. And then you can see um, across the board where the other countries end up. In the United States, we value um, states' rights. Um, and that's another reason why we don't have federal laws that uh, focus on sick leave. Um, when I first started doing this talk uh, three years ago, um, there were only six states that actually had uh, paid, paid parental leave policies um, in place. And you can see by this uh, map here in 2021 that had expanded. Um, still an incredible amount of room for improvement. Um, Illinois, where I reside, and Missouri, where you all reside, do not have mandated uh, paid sick leave laws. Um, in the, in the um, states that have been successful in getting those, it really has been through a group of committed people who it's their passion to, to change that aspect. Um, and so if this is something that excites you, angers you, that you wanna get involved with, know that there is the opportunity to make those changes. The next uh, position that the ACP took is to support the provision of programs in leadership development, negotiation, and career development for physicians and physicians in training. Um, when Dr. Bayani was giving her introduction, she talked about some of the things that you all are doing. Um, I would encourage you to, this I think is an opportunity to, to incorporate your male colleagues, um, perhaps developing a he for she track. Um, Dr. Spencer is uh, currently participating in the Executive Leadership and Academic Medicine Program. And there are a lot of uh, fantastic things that happen in that program that that could be integrated additionally into the important work that you're doing. Dr. Bayani also showed this same um, graphic from the double AMC from the right. Um, I also added in where we started at just uh, um, in 2003 to, to really demonstrate how far we still need to go. So from between 2003 to 2018, we went from 10% deans and department chairs to 18%, so very slow progress. Uh, we went from 14% of full professors being women to 25%. So again, significant progress, but still very slow progress, despite the fact that uh, um, we do have a majority of medical school applicants being women physicians. So some of the things to think about are, um, how do we get women into leadership positions? Um, achieving the rank of full professor for some of those things like dean positions and department chair positions, um, being a full professor is critical and it's problematic. Um, this slide shows you, um, this is from, I believe, 2015 from JAMA, and it shows across the specialties, the percentage of faculty that uh, make it to the, the full professor rank. And in internal medicine, you can see that uh, of male faculty, 21% will reach the full professor status. And of women faculty, 8% uh, 
will reach full professor status. That's that makes it really hard to imagine um, greater progress in our desired state that we're trying to get to of getting more women into leadership positions. So um, what factors into achieving that status of full professor? One is speaking opportunities. And this is a study from the, also from JAMA, um, from JAMA Internal Medicine that looked at grand round speakers, um, both internal grand round speakers and external invited speakers. And in both cases, women physicians are less likely to be grand round speakers. So again, one of the issues with uh, being able to advance and being able to advance into leadership positions. Another key piece of being able to be promoted is publications. Um, and this is an older study. There are some newer studies that aren't quite as um, broad, which is why I left this older study in, but there are newer studies that validate similar issues related to publications um, in both for first authorship and senior authorship across all of the major medical journals. Women are published less. Who makes the decisions about what gets published? Editors and editorial boards. And there is a dearth of women on editorial boards and in editorial positions. So of the major medical journals, 16% um, of the editors are women and 17% of editorial board members are women. Who makes decisions about who sits as editors of these major medical journals um, and on the editorial boards? Typically, it will be boards of trustees, boards of directors. Um, and so the constitution of these major medical organizations boards is also critical, not only related to journals, but also to policy development. And you can see we have a long way to go here. Um, of the AMA's board of trustees, currently 25% of the trustees are women. The American College of Physicians Board of Regents, 41% are women. You can see the American College of Surgeons, it's 34%. Um, the American Osteopathic Association, it's 37%. And then we have some of our um, specialties which tend to um, have more women in them doing a, a bit better job with their, with their boards. Um, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, 65%, Family Physicians, 55%, and Pediatrics, 50%. So shifting gears a little bit, um, but also related is position number five. And this is uh, ACP supports the provision of regular and recurring implicit bias training as well as organizational policies and procedures that get implemented to address that implicit bias. And this was something else that I thought uh, could be built into your skill building um, focus of your organization. So implicit bias is the attitudes, stereotypes, and beliefs that we have that can affect how we treat each other. And we all have implicit bias. Um, it often runs contrary to what our stated beliefs are. And we can say that we believe in equity and we can truly believe, believe that, but unintentionally behave in ways that are biased and discriminatory. So I'm not sure how many of you have taken the implicit association tests on the Harvard website. Um, there's all, all sorts of them. Um, they have them related to gender, to race, to ability, to culture. There's all sorts of them you can take. And much to my dismay, when I first took it, um, I had a strong preference to women being at home and men being in the workplace. Um, this was total contrary to what my beliefs were, but it was related to how I was raised. I had a very traditional family. I was raised in central Illinois where there were a lot of uh, 
gender-based um, assumptions that were made. And so I had to work intentionally to, to overcome that implicit bias. And I worked on it for about five years. And the last time that I took the implicit association taste, uh, test related to gender, I no longer have that implicit bias. So some of the things that uh, feed into that are um, things that happen to us on a regular basis as women. Um, there are these um, microaggressions that happen. Um, we are often called nurse um, or mistaken for a nurse. And this is in no way to minimize the incredible impact that nurses have on our clinical care teams, but it does undermine our authority and very importantly, our confidence. Um, children need their mother. I lost track of the number of times that patients or um, staff asked me if I had guilt over not being there for my kids. Um, and again, that starts to chip away at your, uh, your confidence and your, in your abilities. Um, sounds good, honey. Um, not too long ago, I was actually giving an invited international presentation. And one of the people who asked a question of me called me honey during that. Um, I'm at a point now that it um, doesn't impact me as much as it did before, but previously, again, it led to lots of insecurities and into perhaps the concept, the implicit bias that I didn't belong. Another thing to pay attention to are that women physicians are underrepresented in awards. This is also something that is critical um, for women getting promoted and uh, being able to become leaders. This is an older study from Julie Silver from 2018. There have been more recent studies that demonstrate that this, uh, this issue still, still persists. As Dr. Bayani was talking, I was thinking that uh, perhaps an awards committee could be a part of your amplification efforts um, to have a committee that really um, pays attention to and is charged with looking at all of both the internal and external awards and making nominations. I put this slide in here to um, highlight the, the importance of intersectionality. Again, Dr. Bayani alluded to this. This is a study done related to alpha, omega, alpha. And um, they didn't actually show significant gender differences related to alpha, omega, alpha, but they showed really significant differences related to race. Um, so when thinking about developing your networks of allies and collaborators, um, one of our greatest collaborators at SIU in the work that, uh, that we do with our Alliance of Women in Medicine and Science has been our Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. There's so much of the work that overlaps. Um, so I would encourage you to think about that. The sixth position is related to overall increasing the number of women in practice, faculty, and leadership positions, and doing that through structuring opportunities for mentorship and sponsorship, coaching, flexibility and career paths, requiring the inclusion of females as job candidates and members of search committees. And we already talked about um, a little bit of ensuring diversity, um, but I think really um, taking a look at gender diversity on all of your committees, your councils, your boards, um, you will likely find that there are significant discrepancies based on the um, type of committee or council that it is, the type of board that it is, and really um, focusing your efforts on calling attention to that data and then working with your organization to create mechanisms for accountability. 
The seventh position is calling for research related to um, these gender inequities. I can think of no greater organization than, than your university who is so well known for its research to really uh, um, become a leader in, in some of this uh, gender equity research that really needs to happen. And then the eighth position is related to uh, gender-based harassment, discrimination, and retaliation. So what can you do? So this is from um, the Annals Fresh Look publication by the author of the um, resolution that got the ACP working on gender equity. And she did this through um, crowdsourcing. And so the top 10 things that you can do is advocate. So find something that you feel passionate about. Again, it could be those parental leave policies. It could be something related to clinical care. It could be something related to gender representation on search committees. Um, really find something that you feel passionate about and you feel like uh, is important and get involved in advocacy. You cannot underestimate the importance of advocacy. The second is amplification. And again, I think that uh, um, you all, it sounds like have started to do this. I would encourage you to consider an awards committee, like I mentioned. Um, you may also consider um, as part of your skill building to do um, an amplification workshop on how do you do this. For many people, it's uncomfortable because they have not seen it done. Um, and it is definitely a skill that can be learned. So the second thing is amplification. The third thing is to cel celebrate, honor, and support. The fourth thing is to engage. Um, you need to engage everyone. And again, I don't know a lot about your efforts, but uh, um, it sounds like engaging men is going to be an important step that, uh, that you all take. Um, make sure to, to look for uh, women with intersectional identities um, because their experiences are different. Um, incredibly important, those differences. That is how you're going to know really what you need to do to get to that, that desired state. Um, don't only look at intersectionality from the ethnic and racial lens, but also the LGBTQIA. Um, think about physicians who have disabilities because the pay gap, the leadership gap for those, um, those women are far worse than for women without those significant intersectional identities. Um, help, so be available. Offer up opportunities, offer to make connections, write letters of support. Um, so a lot to be said for sponsorship. Um, another potential skill um, that you could integrate into your skill building is related to writing those letters of support and recommendation. We know that uh, there is those implicit biases that we have often show up in letters of recommendation there are gendered um, language that's, that's used. And so learning how to overcome that is really challenging, but really, really important. Um, so help is the fifth. Sixth is measurement. Make measurement a priority. Um, again, measure and get those numbers in front of people who make decisions. Um, look at the, the rates of promotion. We did this at SIU and found issues and we're able to start to make some, uh, some changes to our P&T process to, to try to accommodate that. We also um, share that information with department chairs so they could uh, do some internal work to try to do that. Um, measure who's on who's being invited as speakers. Um, sometimes just knowing the data will cause you to start to think differently. Um, so make measurement a priority. Mentorship is critical. 
um, promoting equity is also critical as well. So really uh, getting over the, the discomfort of having those discussions um, is critical. Showing respect and sharing what you know. Another thing that had come up uh, when Dr. Bayani was talking about the things that you all are doing, um, I think that uh, sharing and soliciting is really, really important. Um, and so not only inviting female role models to visit WashU, um, but also internally, you all sharing with each other your journeys. Um, sounds like you've done that through some, uh, some blog posts, um, some interviews. You might think about uh, um, some online discussion forums. You might think about some story slams where people can really uh, um, share the nuances of their experiences. So those are some of the things that you can do to, to promote equity. This is a slide from one of my former mentees um, who is now out at Harvard, um, Michael Sinha, and he posted 10 ways for men in medicine to be he for she. And there were a couple of other things on here that uh, didn't show up on the previous list of things that you can do. Um, listen and learn, call out inappropriate behavior as it occurs. So this may be another um, skill-based workshop that, that you all could have is how do you become an upstander? How do you move through that discomfort of calling out that inappropriate behavior and do it in a way that is received positively and can impact change? Um, and I think that most of these other things that we've, we have talked about um, if there are any men in attendance, um, and also um, something for you all to think organizationally is policy around mantles, um, declining to participate in all male panels and not arranging those. So again, some of this is just the importance of being intentional and um, looking at it. So whenever I get invited to be on a panel, I ask who the other participants are and try to make sure that I use it as an opportunity to help to advance someone who, who may not have, have equal opportunity. So you might think about developing policy around that. This comes from um, the Women of Impact, which is a national organization of women in medicine leaders. And this is a, a list that they created um, that organizations can use to make sure that you are advancing workplace equity. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but the, the source was from um, the New England Adjourn NEJM Catalyst. Um, so you all might think about using this as sort of a blueprint for, for your organizational work. And with that, I'm going to close with one of my favorite poems, which is called Progress by Rupi Kaur. And she says, our work should equip the next generation of women to outdo us in every field. This is the legacy that we'll leave behind. And that really is how we get to that desired state that I started with. And with that, I will um, turn it back over to Dr. Spencer. I don't know, are you uh, going to help to facilitate the Q&A? Absolutely. We can co-moderate it together. So Thank I believe you. you can either unmute and ask the questions if, um, if you'd like, or you could put them into the Q&A and uh, I can help read them to Dr. Hingle or she may see them. It looks like the Q&A is enabled. Um, so feel free to go into the Q&A or um, you might be able to raise your hand as well. And it doesn't have to be questions. It also can be comments, um, reflections. And if you all have it figured out, I'd love to hear what you have figured out. Dr. Hingle, that was a really great talk. This is Vicki Fraser. Thanks so much um, for sharing that. 
you know, I think um, many people struggle with um, compensation models and, and some of the historical disparities uh, relate to um, retention packages, the lack of negotiation by some women compared to men, but also the incentives that we give that are often RVU based or call based. So do you have any particular strategies for how we think about making more equitable comp models that take into account the very important contributions women may make, but, but may not uh, relate to RVUs or, or call schedules um, in the way that historical comp models do? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, it is super, super complicated. Um, and we may make it more complicated than we need to. So a couple of things to think about. One is um, for the non-clinical side of things, having, doing the work up front to figure out what a position is worth. So for a general clinician educator, um, what should that base salary be? For a residency program director, what should that salary be? For a clerkship director, what should that salary be? And make that non-negotiable. Um, those currently in many organizations are negotiable. So really kind of setting what that is. Um, on the clinical side, I think it's a little more complicated, but there is some um, work being done and I think the University of Wisconsin is probably the furthest along in their work. Um, they have not yet published it that I have found. Um, I've talked with them a couple of times about it, but uh, they have figured out how to um, do some weighting of the uh, um, patient panels. Um, and so um, patients with uh, who are younger with fewer medical problems get a lower weight, Patients who are um, more complicated, older, have lots of medical problems, they're weighted higher. Patients who are um, women are weighted higher than those who are men because women tend to access medical care more commonly. Um, and they work that into what their productivity um, expectations are based on those um, weights of, of the patient panels. Um, complicated work, but uh, I think three really important work. Um, you know, I think the hope is that eventually um, we do get to um, meaningful paying for performance. You know, right now the metrics are still very productivity based um, and not really quality based. So, you know, time to antibiotics, physicians don't have a lot of control over those. Um, length of stay, um, physicians don't have entire control over those. And so I think the hope is that as the profession hopefully moves to more quality based, some of those gender differences will um, improve because we are seeing that women actually women physicians have better patient outcomes. And so some of that may, may change. Um, so a couple of things to think about. I don't know if that was helpful That's or great. not, well, Dr. Thank Frazier. Thank you very much. That's great. This You're is muted. Yes, fantastic um, talk. And again, folks, we do have to put the questions into the Q&A. You're not able to unmute, which you probably realized right after I invited you to. Uh, but we do have a great question in the chat, um, thanking you also for your great talk and also asking, how do we get men to these events? So you gave a lot of great tips for he, for she, and you know the call to really needing to do that. Uh, and the question is, how? How do we get men to come to these? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, really, again, another challenging question. Um, I think one of the things is to involve them in um, preparing for the events. So get them in your um, alliance, I forget what it was called, but get them in, um, in your alliance, get them on your planning committees, um, get them, 
I don't know if you all have an advisory board for your women in medicine group. Um, our Alliance for Women in Medicine and Science has a uh, advisory board and um, about half of the advisors are men. Um, so you create the, um, the engagement so it becomes important to them. Um, that's one of the ways. Um, I think another way is finding some, some he for she champions, some men who who do view this as important. Um, I think the, the early career physicians, um, equity broadly is really important to them. And so finding some of them to become champions, um, investing in their development. Um, one of the things that we did at SIU, we had, um, there recently was a he for she skill building, um, program put on by the Women in Medicine Summit. Um, and we sponsored four of our male faculty who were interested in it. all of them were early career, but we sponsored them to, to go to that. So again, um, showing them that not only are the issues important, but that we see them as part of the change can be critical too. Um, so those are two, two potential suggestions are, you know, get them involved in the planning um, so that they are engaged and committed and invest in them, find some people early on who feel passionately about them and let them kind of run with it. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for an inspiring talk that really I think celebrated some of the things we're already doing and gave us some great ideas uh, and practical advice about what else we can be doing. So perhaps I can invite folks to continue to ask you questions if they have them through the Q&A, but I will turn it over to Dr. Brown to introduce our next set of speakers. And thank you, Dr. Hingle. Thank you. And you know where to find me if I can ever be helpful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs>